Okay, thank you. Um, Hello, after a very energetic uh, keynote speech, uh, we have our fifth panel. I, sw I swapped the chair uh, position with Rahman Hoca. So I will be moderating this panel. Uh, we have five, uh, including uh, Ahmet. Uh, we have five papers. So I kindly ask you to limit your presentations 10, 12 minutes, uh, and then we will have more time for uh, questions and more uh, elaborate uh, with the discussions. The uh, name of the panel is Soviet Legacy is Still in Practice Historical Transformation in Eurasia. And uh, we have five papers starting with uh, Mikhail Rasin, uh, starting with talking about the Hazar, Hazar identity. And then I think we will come to the more uh, recent uh, affairs about the Soviet legacy. Uh, Mikhail, you have uh, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, and your paper's title is The Hazar Hakanate in the Works of Ar Artamonov and the Gurmilev. Yes, the floor yes, is yours. You. Thank you. So let me just quickly share my screen. So good afternoon, dear colleagues, and uh, thank you very much for uh, for this possibility to present my current research in this panel. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, Soviet historiography related to the Khazar Khaganate, and I will be focusing especially on the works of Mikhail Artamonov and Lev Gumilov, who significantly contributed and affected the research of this, of this topic. And I would like to start with some very brief overview of the Khazaria as a historical entity. Uh, so the Khazar Kaganate or Khazaria was a state that existed from the second half of the seventh century until the mid 10th century with the territory that included um, Crimea, the coast of the Caspian Sea and what is now Dagestan uh, to the north. And as you already see on the, on the map, uh, as you already see on the map, uh, due to its geographical location, the study of Khazarian history has naturally been of interest mostly uh, to Russian and Soviet historians, uh, since it was directly related to the history of peoples in Central Asia and around the, the Volga region. So one and one of the essential aspects of the historiography of Khazar Khaganate has been related to Judaism, uh, which was alleged state religion of the Khazaria. And this topic has led to a very heated discussions, particularly during the 20th century. And it has been a key factor in determining views on the history and overall importance of the Khazaria, especially in relation to the Kiev and Rus. And uh, speaking of Soviet historiography and um, academicians who, who, who uh, worked in this field, I would like to start with Mikhail Artamonov who was an archaeologist and historian based in Leningrad and who became a leading Soviet expert on the Khazars in the 1930s. And according to Peter Golden, the publication of Tomonov's fairly short monograph uh, called Ocherki Drevnyesha History Khazar from 1936 uh, marked the beginning of modern research into Khazar history. And one of his principal tenets of, uh, was an argument that Khazar Khaganate was a uh, major positive influence in shaping the Kievan Rus in its early days. And Artamonov's publication also stressed the high level of political organization and independence of the Khazaria and its significant influence on the surrounding states. And as noted in current research for, by Mark Bassin, Artamonov's monograph from 1936 uh, was quite clearly a reflection of the political situation of that time. And to be more specific, uh, to a large extent, it uh, conformed the internationalism embraced by the Bolsheviks shortly after the revolution. And what is very important in terms of my own study is that in mid-1930s, Artamonov's research attracted another, another uh, 
younger historian from Leningrad, uh, which was uh, Lev Nikolaevich Gumilev, who joined him in several archaeological expeditions. Um, however, their collaboration was interrupted in 1938 by Gumilev's first arrest and in prison. And eventually, Gumilev spent several years in labor camps and was released only in 1943. And speaking of uh, 1940s, uh, the war put a stop to many of Artamonov activities as well, and including his archaeological research. And Artamonov resumed his research only in 1949. And again, Gumilev briefly joined these expeditions, only to be arrested once again in November of 1949. And this time he received a 10 year sentence and was released only in 1956. Uh, meanwhile, Artamonov continued his research until 1951. And at the time, he was also finishing his important monography on the Khazar history. However, at the end of 1951 came first ideological and political shift and revision of the Khazar historiography. And the beginning of this revision started with an article published in Pravda newspaper in December of 1951. And this article featured a sharp criticism of the existing academic view on the Khazars, and it was also pointed specifically on Artamonov's findings. And now, obvious question is, uh, what was the reason of this radical discourse shift? Uh, well, when viewed in the broader historical context, uh, the publication of this article clearly reflected um, the general change in international Soviet politics, and this has been obvious uh, since the second half of the 1940s by a renewed fight with so-called cosmopolitanism, uh, which was viewed as undesirable in the Soviet environment. And one of the practical outcomes was that Stalin oversaw the closure of a number of Jewish inst institutions, while the publication of some Jewish periodicals was restricted. And this anti-Semitic campaign intensified in May uh, 1948, with the declaration of the independent state of Israel and eventually culminated in the early 1950s. So the criticism of the then current research of the Khazar history came uh, at the height of the anti-Semitic campaign. And in case of Artamonov, the main issue was uh, that Artamonov was accused of uh, attributing too much importance to the Khazaria and too little to the independent development of medieval Rus. And the article concluded that Artamonov's approach was completely wrong and unacceptable. So the criticism of his paper and research caused a several years delay in the publication of his almost finished monography on the history of the Khazaria. But despite all the problems, Artamonov eventually managed to uh, publish his monography in 1962. And overall, uh, his long archaeological and historiographic research uh, brought the topic to the attention of the next generation of Soviet academics. And one of them was already mentioned, uh, Lev Gumilev. And now speaking of Gumilev in the Soviet academic milieu, well, as noted by Mark Basin um, and several other researchers, Gumilev was a relatively marginal author and basically unknown to the general public until the 1980s. Uh, but also in 1960s, some of these ideas began to gain traction among new wave of Russian nationalists. And in the decades that followed, their attitude to Gumilov's ideas would often shift uh, radically from positive response to a sharp criticism. Um, however, the first important theme of Gumilov's research uh, that strongly resonated with these groups of intellectuals uh, was his view of the history of Khazaria, which he published in late 1960s and early 1970s. And in general, one of the most frequently discussed topics is Gumilev's concept of ethnogenesis, uh, describing his key theoretical work called Ethnogenesis Perazimli, which was uh, officially published only in 1989. But in this work, Gumilev attempted to generalize some of his practical findings into a broader con theoretical concepts. Um, but uh, we do not have time to de dive deep into Gumilev's complex ethnogenesis now, but I would uh, like to stress important things that 
uh, is that the Gumilev used Khazaria history as illustration of his theory. So in, term, um, in terms of Khazaria, now I'd like to focus on several controversial ideas which Gumilev published during the 1960s and in a series of papers titled Lanchafti Ethnos. And I will also mention his radical revision of the Hazar history, which was originally intended to be published under the nationalist publishing house called Moabai Guardia, but eventually it was published only in 1993, uh, shortly after Gumilev passed away. So uh, now let's take a brief look on Gumilev's interpretation of Hazar history. And uh, the key takeaway of his studies was that the most important one was related to the alleged Jewish religion of the Khazaria. And as a historian, Gumilev clearly uh, followed Artamonov's footsteps, uh, reiterating the same arguments that Artamonov made in the 1962, um, highlighting the weight hazard that arose between the ruling Jewish elite and the Khazar people. And like Artamonov, he viewed the Jewish rulers as the foreigners who illegally seized the power in the coup and represented the major danger to Kiev and Rus in general. And this uh, very negative depiction of the Jewish, of the Jews was also the main point of interest of the Russian nationalists who became to form at the beginning of 1960s. So in the mid 1960s, the supporters of Russian nationalism began to form so-called Russian clubs and had two main journals, Nash Sovremenik and Molodai Guardia, which served as their main uh, publication platforms. And the debate in these national circles revolved uh, mostly around the position of ethnic Russians in the Soviet Union. And one faction in particular, so-called Gosudarstveniki, highlighted the unfavorable status of ethnic Russians compared to the non-Russian uh, nations of the Soviet Union and claimed that it had a significant detrimental effect on Russian statehood and national identity. And very soon the Jewish community became the main target of this criticism. And while Khrushchev's criticism of Stalin's cult of personality and put a temporary stop to that xenophobic domestic policy, it again reasserted in the mid 1960s, uh, this time under the guise of fighting against world realism. And despite the fact that Gumilev was never a part of these Russian clubs, um, his radical revision of the Khazar history from 1960s uh, received a very positive reception among these Russian nationalists. And Gumilev's radical arguments laid the groundwork for their own anti-Semitic activities. And what is the most important, Gumilev's next major opportunity to expand on his historiographic and theoretical arguments came in the 1976 uh, when he was asked to contribute to a series of popular science comp compilations titled Prometei. And these books were published by Molodai Guardia, uh, which was also a publishing house uh, that published the autonomous nationalist journal. And Gumilev was asked to contribute a rather long paper on the history of the Khazaria, and the resulting text was a um, culmination of his views on the Hazaria in a more theoretical context. And in some respect, in fact, even further than Artamonov's forced revision, as Gumilev used Hazar's history uh, to illustrate important aspects of his uh, theory of ethnogenesis. And to conclude uh, uh, my findings, I would like to focus on Gumilev's study. Uh, and publishing of this study. Because at the time when Gumilev finished the text, the attitude of the Soviet regime to the activities of the Russian nationalists underwent a major change. And the growing nationalist opposition to Brezhnev, uh, Brezhnev's policies was met with a sharp uh, rebuke from the regime. And the nationalists received several clear warnings uh, during the second half of the 1970s. So the rejection of uh, Gumilev's study uh, in 1976, and the uh, subsequent um, systematic obstruction of his later papers uh, was closely linked to this mentioned 
effort of the Soviet Union to control the Russian nationalist groups. And it all happened despite the fact that Gumilev never entirely endorsed the Russian ethnic nationalist movement. Um, and this actually became apparent, especially in 1980s, uh, when Gumilev shifted his focus from Khazaria uh, to the Russian medieval history. And this time, um, the Russian nationalists directed the assault on his dangerous um, Eurasianist ideas, uh, which eventually marked a significant rupture among several nationalist groups. And it all escalated later in 1980s. But this is actually the topic of my another study. So I guess I will just stop there. And I think, yeah, I think that's it from my side. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, very interesting topic, actually. Uh, I'm not an historian, but I listen very, uh, I'm very interested in the issue. So to see how uh, history and history writing and politics interplay. So very, very nice, uh, very interesting uh, study. Thank you for that. Okay, our second uh, presenter is Oksana Armaleva from New Europe College Book Bukrish, um, uh, Border Order Making and Transborder Networks in Soviet R Russia in the 1920s. The floor is yours, Oksana. Thank you. I'll make the demonstration on my screen. Uh, can you see that? Yes, we can see your presentation. Okay, fine. Uh, in my project, I study the transformation of Russian and Russian imperial borders as a result of the revolution 1970 and the civil war. And I also explore the shift towards preventive violence as a major Soviet governing strategy from the 1920s and increasing tendency towards intensified border control versus the reality of local transborder networks. Um, a few words to explain the map. The geopolitical space of northwestern Russia is a vast inhabited area in northern Europe of historical significance to Russia, Finland, and Sweden. Uh, it has always been a, a watershed between east and west in the European north. A borderland with the Balkan instability of boundaries. During the period of Russo Swedish wars, in its history experience, no uh, division under no less than nine peace settlements and witnessed multiple shifts. Um, in the 20th century, the local ethnic communities became the subject of a struggle between Finland, backed by the European powers, and the multinational uh, <laughs> Soviet Union. On the right side, you can see three main research questions of my project. Um, however, I, want to, I think I want to spend time on commenting that due to the time limitations. Uh, this is the presentation roadmap. Conditionally, I divide my study into two sections of different border strips of the Russo Finnish border in the respective regions. The regions um, of Karelia and an area of the Karelian Isthmus. Uh, in each of these cases, I study historical context, imperial ethno-political landscape, existing transborder practices, and on the basis of the archival documents, I analyze post-revolutionary changes. Analytical framework of the research. I use some recent approaches stressing fluidity of the borders and importance of the contextual aspects of research. Uh, for example, the concept of a border scape to designate local variations within the single border strip. Uh, my, uh, one of my directions is to explore the role of environment in border making, namely how natural landscape, climate, geographical specifications of the border influenced its operational capacities in imperial and Soviet periods, and how they were treated by the border controlling authorities in different times. Finally, comparative cross-regional approach in the, way, in the framework of the Soviet border within a single, with a single state. On the one hand, uh, 
it's I think it's absolutely necessary since traditionally cross border practices differed very much. And uh, due to the different ethnopolitical landscape and geographical location of the border strips. On the other hand, there is a problem of overlapping, especially in the aspects of espionage and smuggling, with which I'm currently struggling. Uh, source problems. Uh, first of all, it's limited access to most of the Soviet political police materials. And uh, also due to the COVID limitations, uh, I haven't obtained access to the Finnish archives. Uh, nevertheless, I worked with the multiplicity of the sources related to the early Soviet border controls and trafficking, including archival materials on the inter-institutional rivalry between the different institutions entrusted with the border controls. And uh, an important archival um, the real is the criminal case is started on the premises of smuggling and illegal border crossing by the Soviet political police. Uh, they contain questionnaires and multiple interrogation protocols, so the contraband and espionage cases from the 1920s. Um, uh, uh, this is the actually some historical context uh, depicting one of the moment of the most dramatic episodes of the civil war in the region and its long-lasting consequences, the so-called Karelian uprising of 1921-1922. Uh, this is important to understand the situation that became the Bolshevik nightmare and triggered the fears of the uprising in the borderland throughout the 1920s, generating the idea of the constantly endangered border. And that finally resulted uh, at the end of the 1928 in the flow of false information from the local uh, political police uh, to the Leningrad uh, administration about the imminent danger of an uprising. And I think uh, uh, this uh, situation actually fueled Stalinist fears and largely contributed to the path dependency of the region. Uh, from uh, on this side, you can see a map of the uh, Karelian Republic from 1924, and on the left, the Soviet Finnish border. Uh, red dots actually mean customs outposts along the border that were established in 1990. Uh, I'll focus on the interagency rivalry for resources and smuggling between Soviet political police and customs administrations which became a distinguishing feature of Soviet border controls up to the beginning of the 1930s. It was caused by the institutional chaos since both agencies were entrusted with similar functions of border protection. Combination of imperial practices of economic border controls and new Soviet context with its increasing pressures and lack of material and human resources. A uh, Soviet politicized um, uh, uh, policy of, um, of enrollment uh, resulted in mass enrollment of Finnish nationals into the border guard and customs institutions, and then their dismissals from 1923 as a result of the cleansing policy. As a result, extremely low qualification levels of the officials in charge of border control uh, became a distinguishing feature of the Soviet borders. And hybrid local networks defying Soviet border project. The guards enrolled for seasonal labor for peasants, for example, resided together with the contrabandists and actively participated in smuggling. The same situation was with customs officials who frequently sent fake reports to the central administration. A little bit more about local responses. Uh, they were partly caused by the so-called Soviet amnesty for Korean refugees, uh, as a re uh, which triggered transborder uh, illegal crossings. As a result, Finnish and uh, Soviet intelligence services actively employed contrabandists who visited there and supported their families in the Soviet Union financially. Additionally, inhabitants of the borderland villages and Masse went to Finland to survive, exchanged the uh, commodities. Double functions of local Soviet officials, they composed the so-called letters to the bandits uh, uh, to be uh, transferred with the contrabandists to the relatives in Finland. And at the same time, they composed petitions or complaints to the Soviet government for the local peasantry. And as a result, uh, the effect of unrecognized or virtual Soviet border, uh, which actually existed just on paper, 
Uh, the actual of Bodrian's classical understanding of a, called, um, a defense line with regular armed guards patrolling the area with the German shepherd dogs became a reality only under the high Stalinism by the end of the 1930s. And the means by which these goals were fin was finally achieved was cleansing and repressive operations in the broader zones. In my work, I concentrate more on the first counter espionage operations in this zone, which are less research contrary to the later operations. And the year 1925 is important in this respect, for it marks a transformation of the Soviet policy along the entire Western border belt in this respect. Uh, so, it's about the so called oldest, oldest case of 1928, an interesting moment of development of a mass Soviet political culture of origin conspiracies, when two leading officials of the local GPU concocted a faked report of an imminent uprising in the border zone prepared by the Finnish intelligence services. They were dismissed, but two years later, first deportation started. Uh, this is the study of a second uh, what a street for a rest of Finnish border at the Karelian Isthmus. This is a strategically important area. And on the map, the red line below uh, marks the border up to 1939, before the beginning of the Winter War. And the red line at the top, border after the Winter War and the Second World War. In this case study, I explore how geopolitical importance and highly developed trans border transport infrastructure influenced border operational capacities and illegal trans border trafficking. It was through this border that the revolution was actually exported in 19, uh, <clears throat> at the beginning of the 20th century. And at the same time, even when the Imperial Soviet government admitted strategic significance of the border and its dangers before the revolution, it was frequently not treated seriously locally and called the most comical border in the world, even by those who were entrusted to protect it. Paradoxically, the revolutionary flow across it swept the Imperial governments and resulted in one of the most dramatic events of the 20th century. And uh, on the left uh, uh, corner, you can see the Gulf of Finland uh, was a major contraband route, which I also explore in my project. So, um, extremely weak border controls and impossibility of controlling trans border exchanges up to mid 1930s was a characteristic feature of this border strip as well. And But a distinctive feature was an active integration of the Soviet political police GPU into the economic border controls. And much lower level of interagency rivalry was caused by strategic importance of this border strip. And infiltration was a major and only method to counteract Finnish espionage, well-known trust operation in the second half of the 1920s. I think the specialists might know that. I study uh, Petrograd networks related to smuggling and other illegal transborder activities across Soviet Finnish border. They were diverse and manifold, included participants of highly diverse social, economic, national background. And some Chica GPU Soviet political police officers were actively involved in them as freelance consultants, let's say. Uh, large scale contraband trafficking involved in Soviet trade organizations and uh, multiple networks. Refugees trafficking became one of the major sources of income for borderland peasantry at the beginning of the 1920s. And I, I tried to study the motives uh, of why, the, uh, why and how they became the involved in those networks. Um, the demise of the Russian Empire included dramatic changes on the economic, social, population structures in the borderland. The project explores traffickers' biographies on the basis of the criminal cases started by the Soviet GPU. In particular, it focuses on the illegal transporter networks, their functioning, and levels of integration into the local Soviet administrative structures of government, uh, which was actually a really light threat on the Soviet side. And I was amazed by the um, a large number of uh, mid-level uh, uh, Soviet officials who became involved in those networks, but some of them not uh, completely knowing about the goals of these networks. 
our conclusions and directions. Uh, Soviet politicized water making projects heavily relied on imperial practices of water control. And uh, the outcome was non functional and unprotected water at the beginning. At the Russo Finnish border, different border regimes can be identified in the 1920s on the basis of the comparative cross regional parameters. Methods of the border traffic controls differed at the Karelian Isthmus from Russian Karelia. And in the 1920s, the border of the Karelian Isthmus became a smuggling and espionage window, which the Bolsheviks actively used until the end of the 1920s. Um, and actually, uh, the first repressive operations in the 1930s were caused by the recognition of um, yeah, of uh, infiltration and corruption of these uh, uh, windows or uh, strategic crossing points across the border. And finally, cross-regional comparison in the east-west dimension of Soviet border regime studies. Um, this is a new direction of my research. And actually, I, I decided that it might be important for the reason that in the materials of the Soviet administrators, Moscow meetings of the customs directorate officials and, GPA, and highest GPA officers, um, these two border strips, the, the northwestern border in Russian Karelia and the uh, Sino Soviet frontier, were frequently compared due to the similarities of the geographic specification of, of the borders and other factors such as population density, strong transborder traditions of the population, impossibility of controlling it, and having to rely on the border control on the local populations in, in, uh, in involving the locals in border control practices. Uh, well, up to the 1970s, border with Finland was in administrative status. Sino Soviet borderland areas enjoyed proto Franco regime. So, in minds of the population, the borders, uh, those two borders were non existent. And harsh environment, wrecked terrain, problematic landscape, and extreme border lengths contributed to the state of affairs. And uh, maybe just a couple of words why I think this uh, project is important because uh, it, right now, after the uh, COVID situation in August um, uh, uh, 2020, there was a mentioning that uh, the number of illegal border crossers uh, increased twofold uh, from Russian Federation to Finland. And uh, these are the migrants, and this still poses a great problem. And there are still networks existing that um, is the situation that that means. Thank you. Thank you, Oksana. Actually, uh, it was really great to hear that uh, today's border problems uh, were actually problems in the past. Uh, because we only saw refugee issue as a modern issue, a European issue. But when I hear your presentation, I thought about, okay, you talk, talk about the um, uh, Karelian refugees, amnesty for the refugees, human trafficking. So they were also issues for the past. So thank you for the interesting uh, projects uh, sharing with us. And I think now... Um, it's time for Karolina Baraniak, University of Brokula. Uh, she will be talking about more personal accounts of the uh, a Soviet legacy persecuted by the communist authorities honored by successive democratic governments, uh, the cursed soldier in Polish, collect, uh, Polish collective memory. The floor is yours, Karolina. Good afternoon. I hope that you can hear me. Yes. I apologize. I apologize for not turning on the camera, but I have a very unstable internet connection and I am afraid that I can be disconnected at any, at any moment. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this conference. Uh, let me now move on my presentation. I will just uh, upload the file. Uh, one moment, please. Um, screen. Yes, screen. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can see your presentation, Carolina. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, 
so the cursed soldiers, or originally żołnierze wyklęci, were the members of the Polish post-war in independence and anti-communist underground, who resisted the Sovietization of Poland and its subjection uh, to the USSR. Fighting the forces of the new aggressor, they had to deal with the enormous propaganda of the People's Republic of Poland, which called them bands of reactionary underground. On the other hand, soldiers active in the anti-communist organization and armed units who found themselves in the files of the security apparatus were uh, as the, uh, the enemies of the people. Uh, the mobilization and fight of the cursed soldiers were, was the first instinct of self-defense of, of Polish society against Soviet aggression and the force imposed by the communist authorities, but also an example of the most numerous anti-communist armed conspiracy on a, on a European scale, covering the entire territory of Poland, including the eastern, eastern borderlands of the Second Polish Republic, lost to the Soviet Union. Um, uh, in the in, in in the view of the terror used by the NKVD and police services like the citizens militia, thousands of national army soldiers did not comply with the appeal for disclosure or return to the under or return to the underground. The largest of them was the sixth Vilnius Brigade called Wolność uh, Niepodległość, Freedom and Independence, operating in the northeastern Poland. However, the fight against the security service was also carried out by the smaller units, mainly in, the, in Greater Poland or in the, in the Lublin region. As a part of the military op operations, which were in fact a continuation of the previous struggle with the previous occupier, rights of prisons, militia headquarters and individual liquidation of persons responsible for crimes against Poles, uh, against Poles uh, were carried out. The forces directed by the communist authorities at armed resistance pacification can testify to its scale. In total, about 150,000 to 180,000 soldiers and militia men, as well as uh, 100,000 100, Soviet security service officers were assigned to do so. These units were equipped with combat tested equipment from the war that had just ended, supported by the involvement of the services, the strength of police interrogations and pressure from the party that was vigilant over the course of the NKVD operation. Arrested underground commanders, if they were caught alive, were subjected to brutal interrogations during which they often they were often forced to testify conveniently for the authorities, example showing alleged cooperation with the with Germans. However, even trivial information from the point of view of the interrogated person was important for the investigators as, as it increased the knowledge of the apparatus about the underground organization. The complicated issue of the chauvinism and crimes on the on the grounds of nationality, sometimes ascribed to cursed soldiers, requires a detailed explanation. Let it be summarized here in the most substantive way possible. Occup occupiers do often base their power on the local national minorities. This was the case with the Soviet occupation of the eastern territories of the Second Polish Republic and with the occupation of the western Ukraine by the Germans. The fight against such imposed power becomes a fight, a fight against the ethnic group. In these disputes, most often lead to bloody re revanchist crimes, and the, an example of which is the slaughter that took place in Volhynia for years. The murder of communist activi activists of Jewish origin by the underground certainly took place, but the matter is still so emotional that it requires a throughout per presentation. While Poles suffered a lot from the Ukrainian nas nationalities, the unpleasant news is that according to the Institute of National Remembers, the re retaliatory actions carried out in 1945 and 1946 in Polesia and Podlesia bore the hallmarks of genocide. At the same time, in the first post-war years, Wolność in Niepodległość units were able to sign a ceasefire with the UPA in these areas and even cooperate against the common Soviet enemy. The attitude of the Polish population towards the armed units was varied. 
the authorities largely bought the inhabitants of the village with the land reform parceling out former landowners' estates. Political complexities, the existence of two governments in London and in Warsaw, forest guerrillas against the Polish administration, these were complicated matters for educated people and even more for and even more so for the masses, the private of information, inhabitants of the village devastated by the war. Forest units were based on cooperation with peasants who feed them, uh, who fed them and gave them uh, winter shelter, but with time this sacrifice began to be treated as an unpleasant duty that's, that exposed them to several repressions. So it happened that the help was forced, which remains in the memory of, in, of the inhabitants of some regions of Poland to these days. Uh, from January uh, 1946 to April 1947, there were nearly a thousand events reported as attacks by the armed underground bands on militia and security uh, and on militia on communist militia and security units in the years uh, 9, 000, uh, 1947 to 1950 there were about 250 such cases in uh, 1950 to 1956 only 60. the most spectacular actions included the release of 298 prisoners in September 1945 in Radom, or making a prison in Rambantov, which resulted in the release of several hundred detainees who were to be transported to the Far East. The last large operation was carried out in May 1946, when over 300 detainees were released from the infamous Zamość prison. Ultimately, the resistance was broken in the early 1950s, the, symbol, the symbolic end of which was the breakdown in 1953 of the remains of Anatol Radzvianik Olecha, who died four years earlier. However, the last member of the armed struggle, Josef Franczak Akalarek, died in Mannheim in Maidan Kozice Górne, near Piaski, Lubalski province, 18 years after the war, on October 21st, 1963. Over the years, uh, the memory of the act of armed resistance to the authorities imposed on Poland has been erased or limited to cases of robbery of individual crimes. There are no scientific studies of anti-communist armed act. Today, the uh, basis of, for the research is created on documents of the security apparatus scrupulously recording various types of incidents. Among them, we know that about 8,000 people actively participated in this underground at the time of the official end of the war in Europe, in May 1945. It is estimated that in the following years, about 120,000 to 150,000 people uh, passed through various organizations, of which 8,668 people suffered death plus in combat, with uh, losses of the security apparatus estimated at 15,000. Uh, 15, the detained soldiers were sentenced to heavy imprisonment of the first charges carrying the greatest burden in the eyes of society, cooperation with Western German occupier. About 5,000 people were sentenced to death and half of the, of the sentence were carried out. The sentence were educated in, valo in violation of all legal principles, often in violation of the court rules, in very stairs of the convicts without the possibility of defense. In the following years, four in the following years, forced soldiers tried to sentence them to even a worse punishment, to oblivion and contempt. Paradoxically, this was, this was prevented by the authorities cultivating the mobile of the so-called fixators of the people's power. In example, the forces fighting against the underground. Monuments of gratitude to uh, Red Army units for their... <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, monuments of gratitude to the Red Army units for the activities in the first post-war years were created in many Polish, Polish cities. Among other things, thanks to this, the belief about the problems with which the introduction of the new power was established in the common consciousness. Uh, and the term forced soldiers or Jonesa Wiklanci was part of. <laughs> 
Can I continue? I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. The term corset chargers or Jean-Yves was first used in 1993 in the title of the exhibition organized by the Republican League at the University of, of Warsaw. It was supposed to be in, uh, inspired by a letter received, received by the widow of one of the underground soldiers. The officer of the uh, People uh, Army of Poland writing it urged her to renounce the memory of her convicted and trained husband. Today we can inter interpret it more broadly because they were in fact cursed fighters for freedom gradually abandoned by subsequent groups, including the killers of the Polish church. The process of restoring the public memory was officially started by the president Lech Wałęsa by awarding the Order of White Eagle in 1995 to Stefan Korbański, one of the underground leaders in his first months. In its first months, and the highest state decoration were also awarded posthumously by President Lech Kaczyński. Since uh, 2011, we have been celebrating the National Days of Remembrance of the Corset Soldiers. Its date, set for March the 1st, commemorates the death sentence carried out on that day in 1951 by the leadership of the uh, Wolność in a Podległość Command. Uh, and the times of communist crimes committed in the first year after the World War II are still waiting for commemoration. Many times their families were com contemplatively de deprived of the information about the fate of their loved ones awaiting the release of the next amnesty. Thousands of members of the families of underground soldiers never got, never got to see them without even receiving information about the date of death of, or the place of burial. Despite conspirational activities, including grave diggers of Warsaw cemeteries who secretly wore down the dates of place of bodies burials, still not have, uh, uh, we, uh, we still not have been able to find all of them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Carolina. Very tragic stories about uh, your soldiers, actually. Thank you for uh, sharing your study with us. Now it's uh, time to hear Aslayit Gülseven from Atılım University. She will be presenting uh, her paper on a historical analysis of the dilemma of Russian nation identity, Eastern or Western. Aslı, the floor is yours. And Thank you very much. Your presentation. Thank you very much. Can you see my slideshow? Okay, then you can hear me as well, I guess. Yes, we can hear okay. you. And okay, hear okay you. then I can start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm honored to participate at this conference. Uh, so first, I want to congratulate the organizing committee for this extraordinary panel. My presentation title is A Historical Analysis of Dilemma of Russian National Identity, Eastern or Western. So whether Russia is part of East or West uh, has been a question discussed since the 19th century. However, there is no concrete answer to this question up to today. And in today's presentation, I will try to provide a historical analysis of the origins of this debate. And I argue that without putting forward some periods and events of Russian history, the debate on Russian identity would not have a right ground. I also argue that this question was a question of 19th century rather than the following centuries. Therefore, I will focus on the political developments of 18th century and will continue with 19th century political and social developments in both Europe and Russia. Okay. So the periods and events that I will put forward are firstly Peter the Great's period, uh, his modernization, westernization, Napoleonic Wars and Vienna Congress, uh, Nikolai I's reign and his doctrine of official nationality, and emergence of Slavophiles and westernizers. Uh, the process of Russian westernization starts with Peter the Great, who was Tsar of Romanov dynasty by late 17th uh, and early 18th century. And Peter the Great introduced a series of reforms in Russia. The main purpose of these uh, 
was to catch the political culture and social trends of Western Europe. And according to him, Western Europe had the reason and knowledge that was missing in Russia. In order to reduce this gap, Peter implemented uh, a series of, let me just move to my slide. Uh, to reduce the gap between Russia and Europe, Peter implemented a series of reforms to match cultural, uh, cultural, social, and political climate of Western Europe. And the initial motivation of Peter was in military terms, uh, especially after the defeat of uh, Russia by Swedish army at the Battle of Narva in 1700. Uh, a military and naval revolution started and it spread to all parts of Russian life. Uh, the act of making Russia part of Western culture encouraged Russians to behave like Europeans. And the Russian elite was behaving as Europeans by adopting their language, customs, fashion, uh, culture of Europe, and at the same time, they were preserving their own Russian identity. The dilemma, the dichotomy started right there. So both the Western and Eastern identity existed at the same time, forming a contradiction, a dichotomy, and that became uh, that dichotomy became a concrete one with the formation of the new capital, St. Petersburg, uh, in place of the old capital, Moscow. And St. Petersburg was associated with uh, enlightenment notions and westernization, while Moscow was associated with the backwardness of Russia. In such an intense integration between Europe and Russia, Russian intellectuals had to address the issue of whether or not Russian identity could exist independently from the Western identity. In that sense, we can claim that Peter's reforms was a turning point, the first point that I wanted to uh, put forward uh, for my presentation. Peter's reforms was a turning point in the debate over Russian identity because the cultural revolution initiated by Peter led the tendency of comparing Russia to the Western powers. Another important milestone was the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon's, Napoleonic invasion of Russia in uh, 1812 triggered the feeling of patriotism among Russians. When Russians defeated Napoleon, they believed that all Western Europe was saved thanks to Russians. And this triumph gave a heroic motivation to Russians, and they believed that they were equal to Europe. But still, Russia was not a European state uh, due to the ge geographic location. Uh, and they continued to question the difference of Russian culture from the Western one, which brought a group to claim that Russians were even superior to Europeans, and we call them Slavophiles. So after Napoleon's invasion, sorry, after Napoleon's defeat uh, in the Congress of Vienna, Russia took its place among the great European powers. In 1815, Russia joined the Holy Alliance with Austria and Russia, and together with uh, European powers, Russia was ready to suppress any revolutionary activity. Russia was in the club now. So this coalition drove a Russian image equal to European powers. But a group both between Russia and Europe, they considered Russia as a non-Western power. It is uh, where the isolation of Russia started. And Nikolai uh, I's official nationality doctrine contributed a lot to this isolation because his doctrine was automatically rejecting uh, the Western liberalist ideals and values. Coming to Nikolai I's official nationality, the Decabrist Revolution, which was a revolt uh, inspired after the French Revolution, was suppressed by Nikolai I, and thereafter he devoted himself to the preservation of the old order. So during Nikolai's reign, Russia acknowledged its role in Europe as one of the preservers of the ancien regime, of the old order. 
while also at the same time distancing itself from Europe in order to establish a unique uh, Russian identity. So uh, Nikolai I came up with a program, with a doctrine. The well-known program of Nikolai I was the policy of official nationality. Um, <clears throat> in Russian. And this policy was developed by the Minister of uh, Education, Sergei Uvarov, in 1833. Uvarov underlined Russia's particular character, history and customs, a distinctive Russian identity from destructive uh, Western influences. According to war of Western values were detrimental and Russia should protect itself from the impact of Western modernization. So he put forward the Russian fatherland and put emphasis on the superiority of it over the West. And this view was also followed later by Slavophiles uh, who approached Russian national identity in contrast to Western modernization and liberalism. The, uh, oh, oh, there were three pillars of uh, official nationality of Nikolai I. Uh, it defines Russian identity through three pillars, three principles, orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality. Orthodox Church represented the moral guidance for Russians. Uh, Uvaro argued that Russia could only be understood through its uh, background of orthodoxy. And more than that, orthodoxy for Russians was a true or truest manifestation of Christianity and also was an asset laying foundation for the Russian political culture of that time. And autocracy was an essential part of Russian life and represented the importance of strong authoritarian leadership in order to maintain the established order. Actually, the two subjects, orthodoxy and autocracy, were entangled with one another. And these two made up a meaningful uh, whole for Russia. Because the Tsar was the absolute ruler, but still he needed guidance from God, who is the absolute ruler uh, of the universe. Nationality, the third uh, principle, nationality claimed the uniqueness of Russians the different character of Russian people. And this character was related to the orthodoxy and autocracy. Actually, nationality somehow comprised autocracy and orthodoxy. And this official nationality doctrine, therefore, formed the basis for the Slavophile argument and had been uh, a clear blue water between Westernizers and Slavophiles while defining this uh, Russian identity. So after the rise of liberalism in Western Europe, the gap between Russia and Europe began to extend. By the start of Nikolai I's reign, Russia began to distance from European notions as uh, Nikolai I resisted the wave of liberalism. The Industrial Revolution also played an important role in defining Russian national character. Before the Industrial Revolution, Russia's link with the East created a sense of inferiority among the intellectuals, among Russian intellectuals. But after the Industrial Revolution, this feeling of inferiority deepened even more. And the Industrial Revolution in the Western Europe had both social and political consequences. Uh, while Western Europe was experiencing these consequences under the label of modernization uh, and liberalization, Russia stayed out of this process and this isolation widened the social and cultural gap between Russia and the West. So Russia was considered both militarily competent and politically and socially backward. Okay, there were two uh, main thoughts on Russia. Russia was considered as politically, as militarily competent, however, politically and socially backward. Um, once more, we are noticing the dilemma here. 
the westernizing, westernizing image of Russia and its creator Peter's image were dominant throughout the 18th century. By the 19th century, as the new concepts of nationhood started to develop in Europe, uh, we see that that image was changing. We are talking about the nationalism trends in politics, in philosophy, and in literature. These concepts penetrated also into Russian intellectual right, life, and Russian intellectuals started to question Peter's reforms and Russia's Western notion of identity. That was another great point. And Russian intellectuals were divided into two opposing intellectual groups, Slavophiles and Westernizers. Both groups dealt with the question of Russian national identity. The Slavophiles supported the necessity to dismiss Western elements from authentic Russian identity. Uh, and Westernizers considered that Russian identity rooted in European reforms. Slavophiles believed in the superiority of the Russian people and Eastern Orthodoxy, and they thought that Peter's reforms, reforms prevented uh, the development of this true Russian identity. The Westernizers, on the other hand, argued that Peter's Westernizing reforms opened the doors to a more modern Russia, so the model of development for Russia should be parallel to the Western model for Westernizers. Both Slavophiles and Westernizers emerged as a response to Peter's reforms. We can see that. That's why I started my periodization with Peter's reforms. So uh, in the later period, Slavophiles uh, were active during 1840s and 50s. But, but following the Crimean War uh, of 1853-56, uh, in 1860s mostly, Slavophiles became rather passive. And uh, this moment, Slavophile movement, started to decline. At that period, Slavophiles' principles were adapted by Pan-Slavists, okay, uh, from a more philosophical ground to a more political ground. Uh, their uh, arguments were adapted by Pan-Slavists and also by revolutionary populists that we call Narodniks, Narodniki. That's why uh, I didn't prefer to put forward the developments after the Crimean War in my presentation, because the marginalization of Russia and its isolation from Europe had already started. Okay, in conclusion, uh, as I indicated in my first sentence, this question has been asked for three centuries, actually, the question of whether Russia, uh, Russian identity Entity, Russian national identity was Eastern or Western, has been asked for three centuries, yet we haven't come up with an answer. And it is almost impossible to have an answer because the answer of this question has several dimensions. These are the economic history of Europe and Russia, the multi-ethnic structure of Russian empire, the 19th century intellectual debate over nationalism, I'm talking about teachings of German philosophers, especially Herder's and Schelling's teachings, uh, and also its penetration, penetration of these uh, nationalistic views uh, to Russian intellectual life. And lastly, the underlying, uh, the prominent events that shaped the debate on Russian national identity. Actually, uh, this last one uh, was what I have just tried to present today. Okay, uh, dividing Russian history in periods, uh, especially 18th and 19th century in periods, in order to understand better uh, this uh, the debate on Russian national identity. So if you look at Russian history, focusing on Peter's modernization attempts, Napoleon's defeat at the Congress of Vienna, Nikolai's official nationality doctrine, and uh, we end up finding the turning points for the marginalization of Russia from Europe. Especially this marginalization opened the ground for the debate on Russian identity 
being uh, Western or Eastern. Uh, so I should stop now. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Aslı. Uh, our last presenter uh, is not here. So we have plenty of time for questions and answers. We had a very uh, diverse perspectives, but they're all focusing on similar things, Soviet legacy. And uh, we can also say that as an international relations expert dealing with today's politics and society. So I saw many uh, legacies uh, from your presentations that affects today's international affairs between Russia and uh, Europe, between Russia and Finland, for example. So uh, I'm very glad to uh, chair this panel, actually. I learned a lot. I is inspired a lot. Thank you for you all. Uh, OK, now uh, I would like to get some questions from the audience or uh, if you have any questions towards each other so you can just raise your hands uh, or you can write your questions in the chat uh, the questions from the chat will come to me and i read your questions from the chat okay any questions okay maybe i can no, oh, sorry any questions okay maybe i can start asking my questions uh my first questions to um mikhail uh ancient identities have influence on nation building and state building uh, efforts of many ethnic groups in the lands of soviet russia uh, for example, Apasia has a particular interest in supporting their sovereign rights, rights over Apasia. Uh, as far as I know, uh, Chirikpa, he's an historian and also one of the former uh, ministers of Apasia. Uh, he has special uh, studies, historical studies, archaeological studies on the uh, to support their rights uh, sovereign rights on the apasia so is there any interest in hazar historiography and hazar archaeology in terms of today's nation building efforts of any ethnic groups in russia uh, well yes the topic is still alive in, in in current russia and again the main the main topic of discussion is again related to Judaism, which was allegedly a state religion of, of this of this nation state, and this relation of the of the Judaism in terms of this historical uh, period is the key even in today's historiography. I I I cannot name uh, like uh, give you the list of names of, of the researchers, but one of the. Uh, one of the prominent uh, historians, I, uh, and I have his books uh, right here, is uh, Vadim uh, Schnirelman. And this is the book, Kazarsky Myth. It was actually first uh, published in 2002, I guess, in English. But then it was uh, reprinted in 2012 in Russian. And was, uh, it was like complied with additional information. So I guess this is the one of the current historians who who uh, who take the, took a look on on this um, Hazaria historiography. Yeah, Schneiderman, this is me. Thank you. Any other questions? No, no questions. So I can go with my questions as a chair. <laughs> I can go uh, with my notes and uh, my questions. Uh, I have a question to Oksana. Um, so uh, do you think these border making practices uh, during the Soviet Union, uh, the early Soviet Union times, have continued to affect uh, today's uh, border practices? between Finland to Russia or between Baltic countries and Russia. You briefly mentioned about the COVID-19 and the cross borders was doubled uh, during COVID-19. Uh, can you give more examples or? Um, 
Yeah, sure. Uh, in the 20th century, dur during the Cold War, uh, the border crossings were banned for their uh, ordinary citizens. And from the demise of the Soviet Union from the 1991, the border actually opened for uh, the uh, citizens of both Russia and Finland, and the large transporter flows uh, started in both directions. So the border was opened, but uh, of course the uh, the relations between Russia and Finland are not particularly easy, and uh, dipl diplomacy influences a lot uh, transborder migrations and vice versa. And among the most interesting uh, uh, occurrences, I can mention the so-called hybrid war of the 90 of 2015, when suddenly a wide flow of illegal migrants flooded to the Finnish territory through the uh, border outposts. And Finnish uh, diplomatic, uh, diplomatic agencies blamed Russia for the so-called hybrid war, that these were the provocations. And another incident is uh, the so-called post-COVID developments yet again. Um, but um, I would say that what, what actually changed uh, from the Soviet times to now, that now all those occurrences are or have immediate diplomatic consequences. As soon as something happens, immediately that, that's discussed on the higher level. And the dialogue is much more open, for example, than, than it was in the Soviet, uh, early Soviet times, of course, not so much politicized and influenced by ideological hostilities, I think. And another thing is that, um, as I mentioned, that the problem of uh, transborder, illegal transborder migrations is still uh, very poignant for the Finnish uh, border. And I think uh, and fi my final uh, remark will be that the uh, the discourse of the border provocations from the Russian or Soviet side is still is still another legacy. Uh, you, I think you might remember the so-called Manila accident when their winter was started from, from <coughs> actually with a Soviet provocation. And again, this issue of the uh, conflict or border provocation is still in the air. Thank you. Thank you, Oksana. Uh, good luck with your uh, research. It's very interesting. Thank you for sharing again. And uh, maybe I can continue. Uh, no uh, comments or questions from the audience. Uh, but for Asla, uh, so when I was listening to your uh, presentation, actually, uh, as a Turkish uh, citizen, it gives me lots of ideas about just uh, find similarities between the Ottoman westernization during the 19th century and very similar to uh, this um, Russian experience. Can you explain uh, maybe for the audience uh, what are the similarities and differences between this 19th century westernization movement between Turk, uh, Ottoman and the Russian empires? Yes, thank you very much for your question. Uh, actually, I started my um, presentation with Peter the Great, uh, and we can take the similar developments or the similar reform movements to the uh, Ottoman history, we can parallel it to Mahmoud II, actually. He also started with military reform. Uh, and uh, actually, in the Ottoman, uh, there is a book by uh, Dominic Lieben, a British historian. Uh, I highly recommend to read his book. He's uh, just co uh, making comparison between three empires. Russia, uh, Ottoman Empire, and also Japan. Uh, if I'm not wrong, he is also including Japan. We can observe the similar period and similar uh, a parallel a parallelization between these three empires, actually, Ottoman Empire, Russian Empire, and Japan. Uh, actually, I think we have to look at Europe in order to understand this similarity uh, because all by the start of uh, capitalism, I would say, uh, in the 
uh, 19th century or early 18th century when uh, Russia or Ottoman Empire or when the East started to interact uh, by trade with European powers, they started to take their customs uh, in many terms, okay, or they, they started to imitate their uh, developments, all the developments, it can be in the financial area, in the cultural area, or in the political area, uh, we see the uh, traces of this in the political life of the Ottoman Empire also, uh, in all periods, uh, we can put this parallel, and also uh, between Russia uh, and uh, Ottoman Empire, uh, we can see also this interaction. Uh, and more specifically, I'm now uh, trying to find out which... Uh, uh, okay, for example, young Turks was uh, also uh, a movement that we can uh, underline for the Ottoman Empire. Uh, also, they followed all these philosophical uh, plus intellectual plus political developments of Europe. Uh, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, maybe if I can, if I think yeah, a lot, I can uh, come up with more examples. Okay. Oh, thank you for such a short uh, notice. You gave a lot of uh, examples or differences and uh, yeah. similarities between uh, Russian and Ottoman identity. How they go towards uh, Western and or towards uh, Eastern. And as far as I know, um, within the Ottoman intellectual, uh, not just between the westernness or easternness, but also uh, there is this division among the westernness to, get, uh, to go more like towards the Germans and more like goes to uh, French uh, intellectual tradition, also the uh, military traditions. So there were even a divide between the westernness in Turkish uh, intellectual and the military uh, history. Thank you uh, all. Uh, and OK, I have a question to Carolina. Then we will close down our session. Uh, Carolina, can you hear me? Carolina? OK, Carolina have some uh, internet problems. I guess it continues. Uh, anyways, uh, I really, uh, I'm really glad to listen all of your presentations and I thank you all uh, for your studies and sharing your research here with us. Uh, good luck with your research and uh, I hope we will see you again uh, during the conference or after the conference. Thank you our audience. Uh, okay, uh, Michael, Michael, send us a link to book by Victor Schunemann. Thank you, uh, Michael. Okay, see you. Thank you. Good luck with the uh, research and studies. Thank you.